Thank you for joining everyone. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Today, we're going to go over in more detail the planning and flying of a drone mapping mission. So there's a variety of things you need to do before, during, and after your flight. Before your flight, it's very important to know your drone. Drones are powered by batteries like most everything else electronic these days. Um, drone batteries are sometimes lithium polymer. Um, it's important generally not to leave these batteries to charge unintended. They tend to be very high capacity. And while they are generally very safe, um, if these batteries were you know, catching fire all the time, there would be um, a lot of scrutiny uh, and worry by the public. And I think the, the drone companies would get in a lot of trouble. Um, but there is the, the small potential for a fire um, during charging. And so it's important to, to just keep an eye on them so that you can, can do something if something happens. It's important to dispose of them properly. Um, so not just chuck them in the regular garbage, but hopefully try and find um, a proper electronics disposal facility or something that can, some waste facility that can take care of uh, these high capacity batteries. If a battery is ever punctured or damaged in any way, if um, the drone is in a crash or the battery is being transported and is, I don't know, falls on the pavement, or um, is crushed partially by some other equipment or something, you don't want to continue to use the battery. You want to go ahead and um, dispose of that, that damaged battery properly. A damaged battery can um, malfunction in the drone. It can catch fire. It can cause the drone to not operate correctly. So even if it looks OK um, or you think it might still work, better to be safe rather than sorry and not use it. Less of a problem in the Philippines, um, but if you're flying somewhere where the weather is is cold, um, the battery will drain more quickly. Um, and also, if it's this is a problem in the Philippines, the battery won't charge very well if it's if it's too hot. Um, so if it's you know above 30 degrees Celsius outside, um, and you just finished a flight in the hot sun and you pull the battery out of the drone, um, it's gonna take some time for it to, to cool down and it can, so it can begin charging. Um, sometimes you can speed this up by you know, putting it in front of a fan or if, you're, if you have a running vehicle, um, putting the battery in front of the, the air conditioning vent inside the vehicle. And when buying batteries, it's generally to purchase ones directly from the drone manufacturer. So for DJI drones, you know, buying the DJI batteries um, and not a third party distributor. Um, there are, if you go on the internet, um, a lot of batteries you can buy that are supposed to be compatible with DJI drones. It's, in my opinion, in my experience, it's hard to find ones that are of a good quality and will give you the same performance. Um, I'm not being paid by, by DJI or anybody to say this, um, but so for example, the, the Belize Red Cross had purchased a, a DJI Phantom drone and then had bought some third-party batteries. And they found that, you know, of the, I think they bought six, six batteries, one of them didn't even charge properly. Um, Another one uh, actually didn't uh, sit inside the drone uh, very well. It didn't clip in properly and actually um, was loose during flight a little bit. And they had one problem during one of their, their flights where um, the drone battery suddenly dropped from um, like 80% down to, to 20%. And we think that might've been because of um, a problem with the battery not being being from DJI and either it not charging properly, not attaching into the drone properly, or um, possibly that there was a problem with the, the drone reading the battery level correctly. 
it's always good just you know spend a little bit of extra money um and and buy the the official batteries and there's a question in the chat um what is the ideal charging level for lipo um so with the batteries uh with for the drones a lot of times they're especially dji they are they call them intelligent batteries and they have um built in some various mechanisms where they're supposed to if they've been sitting uh, without being used for a long time they're supposed to kind of discharge to a good storage level um and also the um as they're being charged it will um charge to the appropriate hundred percent um and it will uh, automatically stop charging once it once it reaches that level um, so with some of the um batteries that kind of hobbyists might buy and use for their uh custom drones or the um remote controlled aircraft uh, those can sometimes um be not quite as intelligent or not quite uh not have some of those features built in so you need to be a bit more careful about the charging and discharging cycles and not leaving it uh, for a long time at 100 percent or not letting it dip um too far uh not letting it drain down too far because also um if you drain it all the way to zero it, it damages the battery and you can't it will affect its ability to be used in the future um with the dji smart batteries it has features built in to keep those those things from happening um and yet so there's a a trickle stage um at the end of charging I think on the DJI batteries, when it's on the charger, it, um, the flashing of the lights changes to indicate when it's in that stage. And that's when it's just doing the last little bit of balancing between the battery cells and um, making sure that it's uh, all the way ready for use. Thanks for asking those questions. Um, it's good to just kind of know the different ways the drone can move. Um, generally, there's uh, controls that you can do with the two sticks um, to power it up. Um, I forget at this moment what the particular uh, orientation of the sticks that you do for the power up um, is. Also, sometimes it's through the controller that you press a button. Um, so pitch is when the drone moves uh, forward and back. Roll is when it moves sideways, left and right. Yaw is when it spins in place, spins either left or right uh, in a circle without moving forward or back or left or right. And then obviously it can, can rise up and lower down. Um, During the mapping missions, generally the drone is uh, landing and taking off by itself. Um, it's You'll need to familiarize yourself with the particular drone that you have for how to land it and power down. Sometimes, um, like with the DJI drones, when it detects that it's within uh, a few feet of the ground, it will slow down uh, and pause even if you're telling it to move downwards and there's a either a button you have to press or an additional command you have to issue to get it to descend the last uh, few feet and land on the ground and then usually there's a final command to get it to um, to power down most drones also have should have a emergency procedure to stop the motors in mid-flight or just during a mission um, really this is for emergency use only um if the drone possibly is has been damaged and is falling out of the sky you might want to stop the motors so that if it lands near or on someone it's only the drone that hits them and not a, a spinning propeller um or if you know if the drone has has crashed um uh, and is again you know has lost controls is falling or is is hitting on the ground but the motors are still spinning um there should be a way to 
move both of the controller sticks at the same time in a certain way. Um, I think like if left down into the middle and right down into the middle is possibly uh, one of the ways to do this emergency procedure. Um, and it'll get the motors to stop mid-flight. It's also very important to, to know what the um, control to, to make this happen is so they don't accidentally do it. Um, they make it kind of unusual. So it's not something you would probably normally do. Um, like you would very rarely push both of your sticks down into the center. Um, but just in case, like you want to make sure that you know what it is and so you don't accidentally do it and that if you need to do it, um, you're ready. The drones will have a variety of different sensors. Um, it's good to familiarize yourself with what these are. Read the manual, um, read any descriptions if you need more details. Um, it should tell you the prop rotation, the propeller rotation, usually in R RPM. Um, this can sometimes, uh, if it's available in, on your display, give you an indication of um, how hard the drone is working and if there are things like wind that are keeping it from, from operating well. Um, if there's strong wind and the drone is flying into the wind, you'll probably see both a, a decrease in speed um, and also an increase in RPMs as the propellers spin faster as it tries to um, maintain the speed despite against the wind. There should be a, a reading for the distance that the drone is from the controller from the from the takeoff point. Um, and this can be useful for uh, keeping the drone in line of sight and also just monitoring uh, its progress in the mission. The distance should probably, you know, increase and then decrease as it as it follows the, the mission path. This can also give you an idea of um, how much battery you should uh, watch before maybe bringing it back. Um, obviously, the, the further away the drone is, the more the earlier you want to bring it back when the battery starts to get low. Um, altitude, you know how high the drone is above the ground, uh, the speed. And sometimes um, if the drone has some sort of obstacle sensing system, the display will tell you if uh, there's any readings from that, if it detects any obstacles. A note on the antennas. Um, the antennas do not have the, the same amount of signal um, going out from all, in all directions. The DJI uh, Mavic Pro, and I, um, I'm not as sure about the the air, the newer air model, what their antenna um, looks like. But for the Mavic Pro, um, the strongest signal is kind of out from the sides of the antenna as it as it comes out from the controller, while it's actually quite weak um, going out kind of the, the end, out the top there. So if your antennas are pointed straight up at the, the sky, are um, you know straight out at the distance, where the drone is, it will not have a strong signal. You want the the vertical sides of the antennas to be um, kind of facing out towards the the drone. Um, the propellers on the drone spin uh, two different ways, and the ones that are alternate. Uh, it alternates as it goes around the drone, which direction clockwise or counterclockwise they spin. And this is very important um, because the propellers uh, need to, to match which direction that arm of the drone is supposed to spin. The uh, Mavic Pro propellers, if you look at them, um, some of them have a little, I think, a white ring uh, around the center point and some are, are blank. And that matches some markings on the drone. And so you need to make sure that you align the clockwise propellers with the clockwise arms and the, the counterclockwise propellers with the counterclockwise arms. And 
most drones will have uh, should have some sort of marking to help you help indicate which propellers uh, match which arm. And if you if it um, some of the drones also you know have a way so that the actual propeller won't attach or won't fit properly to let you know. Some I think you can actually put the wrong propeller on the wrong arm, and in that which case uh, that you can cause some some real problems if you try and take off or fly uh, with the drone uh, propellers attached improperly. Drones um, will have um, fail safes. Um, and you need to check your manual and read up on the fail safes of your particular drone model. Um, and you need to know which settings are available, which ones are turned on and off, and how you can change them. The drones all have a return to home function. Um, and this is used not just when there's a, an emergency problem, um, but also uh, during the at the end of a mission flight. Um, and sometimes just you know when you're done flying to tell it to come back automatically. And you need to check what um, how that works for your particular drone. For some of the more advanced DJI models, they have an intelligent return to home, and it will actually use um, its various uh, proximity sensors, its various obstacle sensors, to identify things like buildings or trees or hills and do its best to fly around those obstacles as it comes back to its takeoff spot. Um, the more basic return to home functionality, you just set a, an altitude, a height above the ground, and the drone um, will move to that altitude and then fly in a direct straight line back to its takeoff point. Um, this can be a problem if there are uh, tall obstacles in between you and the drone. And if the altitude for the return to home is not set to a high enough distance. Um, there are you know, people in the past few online, you can find people who complained about how their drone crashed, that, oh, this drone isn't that smart. Well, it's yeah, because they um, flew it a, to a distant point like on the, the, with a hill or a building in between them and the drone. And then the return to height was, a uh, return to home height was set at something um, like 20 meters when the, the tree was 30 meters tall or there was a building that was in between them. Um, so you need to you know, be aware of the terrain and know exactly what the settings are for the return to home and how that functions. The drone will also have settings for the actions it's supposed to take when the battery gets low, when the battery gets critically low, um, and if the transmission signal between the, the transmitter, the base station, and the drone is lost. Um, and so you just want to, to check all of those and make sure you understand what will happen and when the drone will, will take action. Um, you, it's sometimes a good idea it's usually a good idea to um, you know, set the, the low battery level and the critical battery level um, a little bit uh, higher than maybe is possible to set. You don't want it to set it all the way down at you know, the lowest possible battery level because um, that gives you less, uh, less leeway, less, um, less time to, to do something uh, in the event of an emergency or a, a difficult situation. Um, before a flight, you know, it's not just your drone and it's that you need to know and your equipment and your planning. You also need to um, get the right approvals. Um, so create a flight schedule, uh, make sure you contact the relevant authorities, the barangay captain, the municipal mayor, potentially the provincial governor, um, you know, any sort of uh, police departments, things like that. 
um, and also engage the, the community. Uh, let them know that you're going to be flying above them and why you're doing it, what the plan is. You can, um, especially if you have good internet uh, at your mission location, to uh, plan your mission entirely uh, in the in the field when you're at your project site. Um, usually it's uh, easier to plan in advance. And also this lets you, in the case you don't have internet, um, get everything ready on the tablet and good to go uh, for when you're there. The mission planning software that I'll be showing you is Drone Deploy, and it allows you to load um, a KMZ file, a uh, KML file, to define the boundaries of your project area. There's a couple of different ways that you can create those, those files. You can trace in QGIS, um, and I'm going to uh, show you how that can work now. Um, let me change the, the screen I'm sharing. So one of, um, this is the Humanitarian Data Exchange. It's a online platform, um, data.humdata.org, that has a lot of different uh, data sets useful for humanitarian operations, uh, development purposes, things like that, uh, organized and maintained by UNOCHA. On this website, um, you can search for a specific country. So we're going to go to the Philippines. You can see there's some 240 data sets here for the Philippines. Um, and we're going to look for uh, geodata. Um, actually, no, sorry. I think the administrative divisions is the one we want. Yeah, so here um, we can see that we can download the subnational administrative boundaries. And since we're mapping specific barangays, we're going to um, download the shape files for the Philippines. And help and use that to help us uh, find the, the right locations. And um, that's, that's just taking a second to download. It's about halfway done. And let me pull it I'm off the share screen. I'm pulling up just my uh, downloads folder so I can see that. Um, and then I'm going to switch over to um, QGIS. This is just the, um, I'll, I'll create a new empty project. Checking my downloads. I just finished, so I'm unzipping that folder. So also in QGIS, um, There's um, a plugin called Quick Map Services that allows you to search different um, map layers that you can add. And in this case, um, you can add Google Satellite, and that can be a useful reference layer. And here, um, I'm also adding the admin level three. So I'm just dragging the shape file um, into the window. Oops, that's uh, not Barangay. I thought that, um, oh, this just has municipalities. It doesn't have Barangays. Um, I have that file. 
So um, is it open source? QGIS, uh, yes, is open source. You can just go to QGIS.org and there's installers for um, for Windows, for, for Mac, and um, I think for maybe Linux as well. Um, but any system you want to install it on, I think you, you're pretty, you should be good to go. If this file is that's not okay. Well, um, so I don't have I don't know where my Philippine barangay file is. Um, I'm sure the, the Philippine Red Cross in their op center has all of the, the different um, files necessary. Um, so we can zoom in um, and I know that um, this is one of the barangays that's being mapped in the project. Um, so I can go to uh, layer, create layer, um, new shapefile layer in the top menu. I'm not sure if the screen share is showing this pop-up box, um, but it, it's the option window for a new shapefile layer. Um, I'm giving it a file name um, in a folder on my desktop, just a example area. Um, and I'm changing the geometry type to, there's a drop down. it's point, line, or polygon. We want an area, so I'm selecting Polygon. When you're creating a, a shape file in in a GIS, um, the shape file has to be one of those types, um, point, line, or polygon. You can't have the different data types within a single um, shape file. You have to have different shape files for each one. Okay. Um, and hitting OK. So now you can see uh, in the side here, um, I have my example area, I can select it. And then in QGIS, um, you can start editing the layer and then there's options to um, add a feature. Where's, I made this the basic, add polygon feature. Um, and so then I can go through and trace the kind of the extent of the area I want to to trace. Um, then I click the little pencil button again to save my changes to the area. I mean, now if I open, if I go to properties, I can open um, the styling. I can just change this. Uh, I don't think again. Probably the window isn't sharing. Um, but there's a menu with all the, the style options and I'm just changing the fill style to, to no brush, um, changing the stroke color to a, a thicker red. Um, and then you can see there. Okay. Um, so now that I have the area that I want to map, I can right click um, the shape file layer and the menu here. And then I can export and I can um, save features as. Um, and then in this window for the save that comes up, there's a format option. And I can choose um, KML, which is the, the file type that I want for the drone deploy. Under file, I can just save it again as um, example area. Um, and click OK. And I've successfully saved uh, to example area KML. Um, so changing share screens. Um, so here's um, you know, QGIS.org. Uh, 
place to download that. There's lots of manuals online about um, how to use QGIS for different things. There's also um, this website called geojson.io that allows you to kind of just do some basic creation of geospatial data in the, the browser. Um, so here I can you know, find that same, same place. Um, I can switch. There's some basic options to switch to, to some different layers. Um, over here, there's a draw polygon option. I can draw my polygon. Um, and then I can save this shape um, as a KML here as well. So saving that out, I'm going to save it to my downloads file as map.kml. Um, so that's another quick way to, to do things. OK. Um, share back to Yeah, um, so geojson.io, uh, less options, but maybe easier to use. Also, if you just need to, to quickly trace something, um, or if you also, if you want to uh, save out the file and, and share it to someone else, geojson.io is a, is, a, is a good way to quickly do that. Oops, and I just did, um, I just did that uh, demo. So, Pre-flight, um, you also, now that we've defined our areas of interest, we need to plan our mission. Um, I think we went over this last time, but uh, just to go over again, the, the mapping flights are automated. Um, it's impossible to fly manually in the right pattern, triggering the camera at the right times to get the, all the images that you need. You provide the, the settings, how high and which area you want to fly and the software does the rest for you. The, the images need to have enough overlap and sidelap um, to make sure that the software can stitch them together into a single map at the end. And usually for a good map, you need somewhere around 70% or above in order to, to get good stitching, good, uh, good connection. For the, the crib project mapping, I think the mapping will take place with one drone per project site. Um, it's possible to do your mapping so that you have multiple drones flying at a single location at a time. In the past, when I've done this, we've um, tried to be safe by overlapping the, the mission areas slightly um, and then starting kind of so that the drones will will never overlap um, and just being careful when they come back in for a landing making sure that we take off um, from far enough apart on the ground that they don't uh, potentially collide when they come back to land or take off and so here you can see um, if they both start in the lower left uh, corners of their areas um, as drone number one gets closer to the overlap area, drone number two is actually getting farther away from the overlap area. And when planning those different uh, areas, if you want them to, to combine well into a single map, you need to have good overlap in that um, connection area. Just a very small uh, intersection will result in kind of potentially a poor map or a failure for them to, to connect really well. So for, um, for the there are a variety of different mission planning apps out there. Um, for this project, we're going to be using Drone Deploy. Um, it has a nice option where you can, can save your missions up to 10 um, with a plan uh, to the, the tablet or the, the phone. And since we're going to be um, where there's little or no connectivity, no internet, we need to be able to, to save those plans to the phone. And so drone deploy just works well for that. There might be other options. I, I have not been able to explore um, all the different drone mapping apps. Um, so I'll go ahead and actually walk through on the, 
um, website itself. So switching screens. Um, so I've already logged in and created an account. Um, I'm going to go to, this is the dashboard. I'm going to go to create a new project. Um, so um, I'm just going to search for any area and it doesn't really matter because we're going to be uploading our KML file. I'll just hit uh, Manila just to get close to the Philippines and then um, click create project here. And I'll give it a name. Um, I'll call it uh, mapping demo. Continue. And then here I want to go to the autonomous plans and maps and models. And here you can see it has created this um, grid that's showing a flight path. Um, we are going to go to, um, so actually I've already, um, on the menu here, there's an option for apps. Um, and I have installed the KML and, and Shape import uh, app. It's a free app that's included. Um, and so having installed that, um, just going back to the map. Um, so my mapping demo project, um, this menu, this option will appear import KML or shape. I can click that um, and select from my folder earlier, the example area KML. And here you can see that now um, it matches that shape that I created. And in a second, the, the background satellite imagery should load up. Um, we don't need an enhanced 3D uh, map, so we can turn that off. And that with a 3D map, if you're doing like a single building, um, it will fly a grid in both directions to increase the number of images and the chance to make a good 3D model, uh, make sure it has all the images of the sides of the structure and stuff like that. We're just doing a normal map so we can turn that off and it saves a lot of time and ends up taking less pictures. There's our satellite imagery. Um, we can set the flight altitude. Um, I'm just gonna adjust this real quick to, to show you something. So here um, you'll note that there's a little icon that shows like a hill with an arrow going over it that turned red. Um, if we click that, it is using uh, elevation data for the for the globe and comparing it to our, our flight altitude. And it's noticing that um, on two of these passes, uh, the terrain is higher than our planned flight altitude. And that's the problem, we're gonna hit a hill. And we can see that, yeah, if we, especially if we launch um, down at the bottom here, uh, when the drone is flying, if it's maintaining 200 feet above its launch point, it's going to, to run into the, to the hill. So one thing we can do is we can look at, um, and this is related to the question, thank you, Alexis, uh, Alexi. Um, what is the recommended resolution for the flight altitude of 200 feet? So here it had, the default was 200 feet. And we can see that the resolution is 0.5 inches per pixel. Um, so that really also is a lot higher resolution than we uh, need. Um, we're not trying to see, you know, we're not like trying to read somebody's, somebody's book that they might have open on a table. So we can, um, can bump that actually up to, you know, three or even 400 feet. Um, and even at 400 feet, um, the resolution is still 1.1 inch per pixel. And so that anything, you know, bigger than an inch basically will still be able to see. And for the purposes of mapping, um, like that should be probably more than enough resolution. And you'll also notice, so at 400 feet, um, each image covers a larger portion of the ground. Like this makes sense. If you're trying to take a picture of an, um, take a photograph of an, a picture on the wall, if you're, or you know, a person, if you're standing right next to the person, um, like the picture is gonna take up 
their, only their face. If you're standing 10 feet away, like your picture will get their whole body. So the higher you are, the more ground each picture covers. And so the fewer images you need to cover the site. Here at 400 feet, um, we complete our mission in less than 10 minutes and only need 84 images. If we're flying at that 200 feet, it's gonna take almost 20 minutes and it will take some, hundred, some 330 images. So we can um, save uh, time and also make it easier to process the imagery without a big difference in the resolution for our purposes by flying at a higher height. Um, we can turn off the automatic settings and to make sure that we have a good quality map, sometimes I like to um, adjust some of these overlaps um, up to maybe like 80 front lap, 75 side lap. You can increase the front overlap without really much of a change in um, t mapping time. It slows the drone down a little bit, but not a lot. Um, because it just needs to take images more quickly as it passes along one of these long paths. The side overlap is where, as you increase that, it can really increase the overall length of the mission because as you increase the side overlap, um, those passes get closer together and you have to conduct more of them. And so each one of those long passes is a lot of extra time that you're adding. Um, I think they have an, an algorithm or something that calculates a good um, flight path, but you can um, play around with this sometimes uh, to kind of adjust things um, and see how you want to, to fly. Um, you can also adjust uh, which waypoint to start? You don't want to mess with that. Um, okay. Um, and then uh, once you can uh, name name this mission, uh, save it and you're good to go. Um, if you want to, then if you're happy with all of your settings and um, so also for the terrain here, you can now see that like with our current area, um, everything should be fine. This elevation data is, I think, probably from satellite imagery or something like that and may not have the super high resolution. Um, so each of like their elevation points might be something for like a 30 meter squared area. Um, so it, just when you get to a site, you'll always want to double check, like look around, make sure for one that the, you know, um, that it looks correct, make sure that there's no obstacles that wouldn't be picked up in a train analysis, so like a radio tower or a cell phone tower, um, or like electricity lines or things like that. Um, there's also, you can uh, set this terrain awareness and the drone will actually try and fly to stay the same distance above the elevation instead of just the same distance height above the launch point. The last time I used Drone Deploy, this feature was not in the app. So I'm not, I don't have experience with how well this works, but it looks like it could be an interesting way to um, build in some extra safety uh, to your flight. Um, if you want to keep your settings uh, and then add another area, you can duplicate, um, you know, rename it to your 
second area. And then um, if you've saved out your KML file, um, you can go to your, find your other file. I have one saved here or somewhere. Um, So just, um, I have a second, oops, maybe not, my bad. I think I, did I delete it? Oh, so I don't have it. Um, but you could then, you know, go to your different area and either upload a new file or, or change the, the location where you want to, to go. Okay. Um, if you wanted to um, split an area um, into uh, a, have two drones fly it, um, you could duplicate. And then, you know, come say, okay, like we'll split it kind of along this road here. Um, add in some extra points. And then I think, then you, by clicking these, you can delete some of the other, um, there we go, delete some of the other points. Um, go to your first one and do the same, but for the other side. Then you would have, um, you know, drone one and drone two for the two halves of your, your area. You do, um, I forgot to show you. So in the advanced settings, um, you'll want to check to make sure that the uh, planning camera is set to, to your drone. So in this case, you know, Mavic 2 Pro, there's also a bunch of others in here that you can select because uh, the different cameras have different resolutions, different, um, different file sizes and things. Switching back to um, for when you're doing your missions um, before you leave in the morning, double and triple check that you packed everything. It's good to have, um, even if you think you can remember, uh, you know, make that list and go down the list. Um, this picture is not from when I forgot something, but um, in the past, my my colleagues and I have um, driven for. 45 minutes to go uh, fly and then realize that we forgot some key piece of equipment back in the office. Um, so, you know, make the list. It's not, and just use it to make sure you don't forget. Um, your team uh, will be, should be a, a pilot in command responsible for the safe completion of the mission. It's good to have a spotter or visual observer to watch for birds, aircraft, bad weather, anything else. Um, just a second set of eyes on the sky and on the drone. And also one person usually for, an additional one person for support. Um, they can you know, explain what's going on and answer any questions of a community member who might come up. They can, um, if there's flight is taking more than one battery, they can take the batteries to charge and they can um, keep the landing area clean, uh, clear of any uh, obstacles or people, um, and just just be generally helpful uh, if something needs to happen um, that doesn't involve the drone that's in the air. Um, 
Um, so yeah. So we're running a little short on time. Um, so it's been a while since I've shared a video. Um, a share sound, there we go. And sharing. Um, So let me know if you can hear this. And if not, um, we'll just we'll have you watch it. Or could maybe um, try, try and narrate. Great. Do you to hear go that? to the pre-flight checks, tap the little airplane on the bottom right. Once all the checks have been passed, you're ready okay, to take off. To initiate that takeoff, tap the pulsing check mark. You can now see on the left hand side of the screen that the altitude is increasing. You can see the flight time, you can see your current battery remaining, as well as your current speed and your distance from home. I'm going to fast forward this flight and come back to you in a couple of minutes. Remember that you can always bring the drone home in the middle of a mission by tapping on the home icon on the bottom right. This will make the drone abort its mission and come right back home. Now you can see the drone is busy landing by looking at the altitude decreasing on the left hand side. Once you've completed your mission, you'll be given some instructions on how to go and upload your data in order to create a map on drone. So for our purposes, we won't be using drone deploy to process our imagery. We'll be using an open source software called Open Drone Map. Um, but a lot of these uh, mapping planning missions make all their make a lot of their money from providing the processing service as well. Deploy.com. Please watch the map engine tutorial in order to get started with this process. If you instead planned on the desktop, or you're trying to continue a previously started mission, all you need to do is tap on that mission when the drone is connected. Here you'll see that we can continue the mission that we previously started, with the first waypoint being the last waypoint that we had achieved. So here, some of your missions will end up taking more than one battery. And so you can monitor kind of the drone. You remember in the previous clip, there was the little blue dot that was traveling along the line. And as it travels, the, dot, the line changes from a solid line to a dash line, the dash showing where it's already been. And at any point, you can you know, click the return home. Also, when it gets to the certain low battery warning, it should also return home. Um, and then you can switch out the battery and resume the mission. And it should resume from that last, that last waypoint where it was. So you, this is where it's useful to monitor the remaining battery percentage and kind of look at your map. Um, it will always go back to that uh, the most recent waypoint, not to the middle of one of these lines. Um, so if you are getting low in battery and the drone is about to start a very long straightaway, a very long straight section of line, it can be a good idea to after it right after it passes that waypoint to go ahead and tell it to return to home. So you can swap out the battery and not waste time and battery flying a long stretch that you're just going to have to repeat because the drone might not be able to finish it before it returns due to low battery. And all of our settings have been saved. To go to the checklist, again, just tap the airplane and when it's safe to take off, hit the check mark at the bottom right. Instead, I'm going to very quickly whiz through the data page. Okay. Um. Oops. 
Okay. Um, and we are coming up on the hour. Um, so I will go ahead and cut the session there. Good evening and thank you everyone for joining the uh, fourth session of the, the training. Um, today, we're just gonna quickly finish the remainder of the discussion on the, the drone mapping missions, and then we'll do a quick demo of no downloading data from export.hotosm.org um, and using that data uh, in QGIS, just a quick uh, demonstration of what um, you can kind of start doing in there. Um, and then later we'll provide some links to resources that people can learn more. Um, I think we'll probably try and schedule some more training sessions after the, the drone mapping in CRIB has been completed. So um, starting again in June. So we finished off yesterday showing the quick um, excerpt, this quick piece of the YouTube video uh, with the demo of the, the drone deploy launch mission, um, showing that you know you just you start up your drone, um, connect the the app to the drone, um, select your mission that you've planned, and then really you just you click a, a button, it runs through some pre-set checks for um, the different drone sensors and for the, the drone system. And then it will, will launch and conduct the mission. Oops. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we saw that, that short YouTube video. Um, it's very important to to be safe. Um, you don't want to crash your drone. Drones are expensive. You don't want to hurt someone. You don't want to damage someone's uh, car, house, uh, garden, anything. Um, this isn't a time to be a daredevil or a show off or a cowboy or any other term that you might might have. Um, for someone trying to, to impress other people. Um, if you, you know, if your crush is on the on the team, don't try and try and show off to them. Um, don't uh, try and do something dangerous. Um, know your limits and the limits of your equipment. Um, you know, be aware of how how long that battery is gonna last. Um, if the wind is too high, or if you know a storm is definitely coming, um, don't push it. Um, better to be able to fly later than to uh, have a mission end in disaster and not be able to fly again until um, buying a new drone or, or figuring something out. Um, just as important to maintain your drone equipment you also need to need to maintain your, your personal equipment, your body and your mind. Um, make sure that when you're conducting drone missions, you get enough sleep, that you hydrate well with, with plenty of water, um, and that you, you make sure you, you eat food. Um, you don't wanna, when you're flying a drone, you need to have your focus and your concentration. You don't wanna skip breakfast or skip lunch. Um, you wanna make sure you're, you're in good shape. A phrase for manned pilots, uh, manned aircraft in the, that I've heard is 12 hours bottle to throttle. And this is referring to alcohol. Um, so if you, if you do drink, um, it's generally a good idea to, to limit um, when you drink. Uh, definitely like the same as your, it's illegal to operate a vehicle while under the influence of alcohol. It's illegal to you know, fly a plane or operate a drone while under the influence of alcohol in a lot of places. Uh, definitely in the US, probably in the Philippines. I haven't checked the exact laws. Um, eight hours is kind of like usually the, the safe. Like if, 
if it's been eight hours since you've had a drink, then the alcohol should be out of your system. Um, but then, you know, 12 hours is, is playing it even, even safer. Also, um, alcohol has been shown to affect the, the quality of your sleep um, and not in a good way. Uh, generally makes you less rested uh, in the morning, even if you sleep for longer. Um, so, you know, when focusing, concentrating on a, on a drone mission, always best to, to wait um, to celebrate until after all the flying is done. Um, it's good to have constant verbal communication for all stages of the, the preparation, takeoff, flight, and landing. When the pilot um, is getting ready to power on the drone and start the propellers, they should announce that um, loud and clear uh, so that everybody else can hear. And if, um, if their teammate is near the drone, they should visually respond to confirm that they heard the command and that they, they know what's happening. You don't want to start up the propellers when someone is or something is near the drone. Um, when you're coming in for a landing, the, the pilot can announce coming in for a landing and um, you know, ask, is the landing area clear? And then the, his, their teammate can check and say landing area clear. Or wait, wait, you know, there's somebody, like there's a kid playing basketball in the landing area. We need to, to get them out of the way. Um, props, the propellers on the drones are dangerous. Um, they're just, they're plastic, um, but they're, they're spinning very fast and they have a thin edge. Um, they can definitely do some damage. They can cut um, potentially even, you know, severely damage a, a finger or an arm or, or um, you know, any part of your body. And like I've said before, uh, you need to check for um, terrain and various other obstacles, uh, things that you know might not have shown up in the satellite imagery, or that um, just you might not have known about uh, when making your plan. Uh, make sure there's nothing that the drone could run into or be affected by. When you're mapping, there's not much excitement. Um, and not much to do unless something goes wrong. Generally, um, all of these uh, mission planning apps will have a way to take manual control at any time. For drone deploy um, and the DJI drones, um, most of them have a switch that goes between sport or P, which I forget what the P, the P is right now, um, but there's two different modes for the drone. And one of when it's in one of those modes, it allows the drone deploy app to control it and conduct the mission. When you switch it to the other one, um, it overrides that and allows you to manually control the, the drone. And so you might need to manually take control if there is um, some sort of hazard, uh, if there's foul weather, if there's rain starting to happen, um, if a helicopter or manned aircraft comes uh, into the area. And it's good to practice um, you know, before you need to use that functionality. Make sure you understand where that switch is, what happens when you switch it. Um, so do some practice missions before you actually go out and are mapping somewhere and test that you can override and end a mission with that switch and bring the drone back, back home. Yeah, some of the emergency situations, like I've mentioned, um, so a rapid change in weather for the worse. This could be high winds, could be rain. If a manned aircraft comes into the area, um, a manned aircraft, helicopter, or plane always has right of way. Um, and you need to immediately get out of their airspace. Any sort of equipment malfunction or failure. So this could be a lost link between the, the drone and the controller. It could just be a, a video feed failure. Um, so you might still have control over the drone, but the video signal might, not might be not coming in anymore. It could also be a loss of GPS. And so this might be, um, because of some sort of hardware or software failure on the drone, uh, which will affect 
the ability for it to return to home for it to pilot itself. Another situation would be a crowd or other obstruction at the landing zone um, and a bird attack or strike. Sometimes um, birds might accidentally uh, run into your drone. Also, sometimes I've seen um, videos on YouTube and stuff where certain predatory birds of prey like uh, hawks or eagles um, will attack a drone uh, thinking it's maybe either uh, in their territory or it's something to fear or something. Uh, I don't know what they're thinking, but um, we'll try and, and attack the, the drone. We can also that. Um, you want to minimize bottlenecks and work smart. Um, like to, to say um, ABC, always be charging. Um, so especially if you have multiple flights in a day, or if you know you have a very large area to cover and map, um, you want to, as soon as the battery you know, comes off the drone and is cool enough uh, to start charging, um, put it on the charger, get it, get it going. Um, it's always good to have extra batteries than have your batteries all be, be dead and run out um, and still have flying that you wanna do in the day. Um, also, you need to remember that the, your phone or tablet that's running the mission planning app and also the, the drone controller, both have batteries as well. Um, and those can't be charged while mapping. Um, so as soon as, you know, during lunch, during breaks, um, put those on a charger, put those on a battery and get those topped back up um, so that you don't have those run out and have to wait, you know, an hour or two for them to charge back up to start flying again. It's good to plan in advance. Um, even if those plans are going to change, at least you have a starting point. And it's good to follow checklists. When you have a long list of equipment that you need to remember and a long list of things to, to confirm before your mission, um, having that checklist uh, just makes it that much easier makes it less likely that you're going to forget. There's a tool called uh, JOSM, Java OpenStreetMap Editor, that I have found useful for checking imagery coverage while still at a mission site. Um, it can help you avoid having to come back. It also, during the process, you can copy the images to your laptop, which is a, a good backup. And it can be a nice opportunity to share a few of the images with community members who are there. Um, so I'll do a quick uh, demo now. Um, so this is Jossum. Um, you can download it uh, from the web. Just uh, if you search, you know, Jossum, uh, plenty of options for, for downloading it. Um, and you want to download the jar file, not the mouse cursor. There it is. Um, you want to download the, the jar file, not the, the JNLP file. Um, or will the Windows installer probably if you're or if you're running Windows. Um, so after downloading that, um, it's just a very basic looking program that you can load up. Um, and I have um, have downloaded um, Some drone imagery, and so here um, you can see is a folder just full of, of images uh, from a drone flight, and I can just drop that folder uh, into the screen here, and it will read the GPS metadata on each of those images, and then locate it uh, on the 
the map in the program. And so when looking at these images, um, you should see a nice even pattern uh, of images going across. And you'll be, it usually it's pretty obvious um, if the drone for some reason uh, missed one of the passes or the camera malfunctioned or it didn't take pictures. So here you can see that we have all these nice evenly spaced lines and then all of a sudden there's a gap. Um, and so this, you know, if we were checking this at the site, we could then um, correct our mistake. We could go back into drone deploy. Um, remember there's that option to start from a particular waypoint. We can then go to advanced settings and tell the drone to start at a waypoint other than the first waypoint. And so we can figure out kind of um, which row we want to start on and get the drone to start um, on one of these rows to, to finish out the, the drone, uh, the mapping. And so here um, I've got the second folder. If I drop those in, you know, if we went out and flew the rest of the mission, um, we could then see that, you know, with the addition of that uh, other folder of images, now we've got the complete pattern going across. And so if we had to, you know, take a boat or travel or um, drive a long distance to this site, we'll be really happy that we checked that and we're able to send the drone back up and collect that last uh, bit of imagery before we left. And after a flight, you always want to manage your equipment and data, especially if you're flying for multiple days. Um, you know, you'll it becomes very hard to remember um, what happened two or three or four days ago um, if you didn't write it down, if you didn't organize. Don't wait until the very end. Um, I've made that mistake before, and it can be really challenging to um, figure out, you know what the settings were on a certain day or which images belong where and stuff like that. Um, you'll save yourself a lot of time and, and pain and headache if you do this right after a mission, right after that day. So you need to rename the files as needed. Um, so here, um, it's probably too small. So these images, um, I think by default, maybe just had um, the DJI um, underscore then 0001. Um, and then so using a bulk file name utility or bulk rename um, utility or something of that nature, just programs that you can download for free um, that allow you to uh, change the names of a lot of files all at once by adding text, by adding a date, by adding um, a number series on the front. And so you can go through and um, I like to add uh, the date to the image just so it's easy to see. You might add the site name to the image file name. Um, if you have more than one drone, uh, they, you know, you might end up with two DJI underscore zero zero ones if they're, you know, both starting taking images. So you can add Kind of a unique ID to the front. Um, here you can see there's a uh, E100 and an M100. I think that was the, the identifier for the drone. Um, and if you have more than, you know, uh, a certain number of images, uh, you might have the numbering might start uh, duplicating. Um, so uh, if on a single day you have you know, more than one DJI 0001. You also need to find some other way to add an additional um, piece to that file name so that if you drop it into the same folder for a site or for a day, um, it will, uh, it'll be uh, unique. It's good to, to back up your files in potentially like more than one place. So you could maybe, if your memory card is large enough on your drone, you can leave 
um, everything on the memory card until you're done with the full mapping exercise and you're back at the office. Um, you can also, you know, use an external hard drive, use some USB drives, uh, use your laptop to make sure that these files are, are in more than one place. Um, clean and store your equipment properly. Um, you know, if, hopefully you have some sort of case or uh, a box for your drone, you know, put it back in that. You don't want to leave it out um, on a table where a dog or cat might knock it over, where a kid might, you know, play with it and break it, where, you know, if it's on the table, maybe somebody's going to accidentally spill their coffee on it in the morning. Um, so just, you know, it, you might be tired, it might be the end of a long day, uh, take the extra few minutes, put your equipment back in its proper storage um, so that it's safe. If you treat your equipment well, um, it will treat you well back. Um, and always, you know, good to prepare for the next day. Uh, you don't want to be rushed in the morning if you are going out to map again, kind of trying to organize and, and get everything ready. Um, generally a good idea to do that the night before, um, get everything in order, um, make sure your plan's ready, get everything charged. Charging can take a long time. Um, and then also depending on your program and your deadlines, it might be good if possible to start uploading and or processing your imagery. Um, you know, so if you're doing it, if you're processing it in the cloud, um, maybe you can, you know, put everything in a Dropbox folder and start getting that synced up to the cloud. So it's a little bit easier um, or, you know, uploading to, to wherever else. Um, I was trying to yesterday get um, a copy of, of Open Drone Map installed on a server for us to look at today. I didn't, didn't get finished with that process. So we're not um, gonna go into that yet. <clears throat> And that's the the end of the things I have to say on on drone mapping for now. Um, so if there's any questions on that, we can can answer those now. Okay. Um, so we talked uh, briefly before about um, using this drone imagery to trace into OpenStreetMap. OpenStreetMap uh, being this um, community created map of the world that allows you to access the data and, and do more, more with it. There um, is this convenient tool called the export tool that Humanitarian OpenStreetMap maintains and makes available. And if you log in with your OpenStreetMap account, you can then uh, export data from OpenStreetMap for a specific area. Um, so I can come in and um, choose. Um, an area of interest, I can draw like a box. And I can um, give it a name. And I can choose which file formats I want. So for, for QGIS, for GIS, um, Shapefile or GeoPackage are both probably the easiest to work with, but there's some other options as well for, for different purposes. And you can choose which data you want. Um, and so you might probably want to come through and if, unless you have a specific project, you can come through and click, um, select all the different uh, tags that are available. Um, and then create an export. And so this um, might run for a couple of minutes or you know a couple of hours if it's a really big area or if there's a lot of other people trying to export. Earlier, I just ran a small one. Um, so here, I can then uh, 
download the zip folder with shape files that it provided. Um, and if I open up that zip folder, inside I can see that um, there's a file for the lines, the points, and the polygons. And that I mentioned earlier um, that with shapefiles and a GIS, that the those three types of data can't be in the same file. Um, you've got to have a file for each one. And also, another thing about shapefiles is that people say, will say a shape file singular, um, but each shape file is actually um, several uh, files on your computer. So the uh, I guess like the shape file itself is probably the the dot sh shp file, but then it has some other files that are required that provide information to the computer about things like the um, the geographic projection uh, that the file is in and some other other information as well. So here um, I've got QGIS opened up, and I can um, drag in. So we'll first, uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and, and drag in our uh, our lines file, our points shape file, and our polygon shape file. Um, so here. For the points, um, we can open up the um, open up the attribute table, and there's a column for all the different OSM keys that could it could have, and so there's quite a few um, columns that maybe are only used once or not at all. Um, but we can see that there are um, some things that show up a lot. So there's a lot of uh, things in the name column. Uh, and then also in the, the place, place equals um, village. So we could actually do, um, if we wanted to add some of these place names to the map, we can, can style this, we could go to properties, um, and it brings up our layer properties. And there's an option for adding a label. And remember, we saw that the, the name column had the text for, uh, for what we wanted. And goodness, there's a lot of them. Um, so yeah, doing a single label from the name um, and OK. And here, um, some of these names start coming up. And then if we wanted, we can see that there's um, not just kind of village names, but also some names of uh, resorts and things. If we wanted only the, the villages, we could go to filter. Um, was it, uh, place. Um, equals, then we can see, oh, we see um, town or place equals village. And we hit OK, and now we're down to just um, place equals town or place equals village. Um, so there's a couple of questions in the chat that I, I missed. Um, so landmark geotagging. Um, so in the map features OSM wiki, um, there's um, some things tags so like natural for um 
It's a little slow right now, looks like. Um, yeah, there's tags for all sorts of natural features. Um, so here you can see um, for things like uh, ridge, peak, um, even just, you know, natural equals rock if there's a, a notable rock or a group of rocks. So um, might be some sort of feature. Uh, sinkhole, you know, for uh, lakes, rivers, um, also for um, for different uh, historic uh, for different um, historic markers. Um, so you might have. Um, a memorial, um, if there's uh, a memorial um, or monument, there's ways to tag those things as well. Um, so really anything that you can observe, um, there's probably a way to, to tag it uh, into OpenStreetMap and then make it available for, for data extract. Um, Jossum uh, is very lightweight. Um, and uh, QGIS um, runs pretty well, I think, on a lot of different softwares. If you are using it to um, do uh, very large geoprocessing, um, like advanced analysis, or if you're using it to um, process or to visualize like a lot of geospatial data, your laptop will need to be more powerful. If you're trying to um, display every single building in the Philippines, um, most laptops probably are gonna have, have trouble uh, displaying all of that. Um, I'm not sure about the operating systems for, for QGIS. Um, We can um, look that up later to find out what, how far back um, on Windows uh, it will run. Okay. Um, so now we, we've got you know, some points for the village names. Um, we can look at our lines. So these are going to contain our roads and things. If we open our attribute table, um, two of the kind of the, the main keys are going to be waterway and highway. Um, the rest are going to be, be largely blank. Um, so what we can actually do is we can duplicate this layer. Um, in one, we can. Uh, can filter to um, highway, what do I think, um, is not null. So is not null means that the highway has a value in that key. Um, I'm going to just rename this, uh, oops. Going to um, rename the layer to lines, highways, um, and then this one I will rename to lines, waterways, and I will filter to waterway is not. No. 
so that I've only the, the things are labeled as waterways. Um, and you can see that there's less fewer rivers and streams mapped. Um, if I go to properties, I can go to style. Um, I can categorize and we can see there's, uh, if we categorize it into categories, um, if we style it by, by categories, we can have um, rivers. So we'll make that a little bit wider um, and streams. We'll change the color to uh, a light blue. And here we can see oh, that um, those things are, are styled. Um, if we put back in our, our roads, our highways, um, those also, um, we can style it instead of a single symbol, we can style it by categories. And then if the value we use for the category is highway, we can classify, we can see that um, in the data, there is footway, path, residential, secondary, service, track, and unclassified. Um, so footway and path, we could just make a, a dotted line for now. Um, residential, let's make it a, a gray. Secondary, we can um, make it kind of like a, a wider, deep orange. Um, service, we'll just make it a gray as well. Um, track sometimes is used for like, um, like a dirt path or something like that uh, in between. Um, in between areas. And unclassified is usually just also um, just a general road that. Uh, so here we can start you know, then seeing um, a little bit more detail about what uh, you know. We can see the major roads, some of the minor roads, and some of these that go from it was a unclassified to a track to a footway. So probably this road, you know, at some point has. Uh, is slowly kind of getting less, less of a road. Um, and then this, you know, is the, the boundary of that area that we exported. Um, but here, uh, if we look at the attribute table, um, oh, the buildings are in here. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to duplicate this layer real quick. Um, and if we filter so that um, building building um, is not null. Um, we can zoom in, we can start seeing um, all of our, our buildings for a, a town for a barangay. Um, and so in this way, this, I want to, um, the island is name kind of island. So place island. Um, so this, I'm just gonna uh, real quick, um, filter this so that uh, place equals island. So that's only that, that background kind of uh, piece. And then I'll change it um, to just kind of a a light, light tan or something for now. Um, So if we wanted to to make like a simple barangay map, a simple spot map, um, we could start start doing this. 
And I can click on um, this little info icon selector and explore things. Um, I wonder if some of these larger buildings might be a school or something. Um, they're not tagged. It doesn't look like uh, with anything, any details. But um, sometimes there will be, oh, so here, this one um, is tagged amenity, place of worship, building equals church, name, Baras church. Um, and so what actually what you, um, what, if we go into the, the properties of this, and if we did, um, so you could um, create rules to style the churches uh, different ways. Um, so here, um, I just, for speed, I just duplicated the layer um, and I'm gonna change uh, the fill to, let's do a, a you know, purple for, and if we filter this um, for, what was uh, amenity equals place of worship. Um, then we could even you know, go in and go to, um, we'll add a single label um, for uh, the name. And here we can see, um, you know, you know Baras Church uh, shown up there. And I don't see, might be the only one that's tagged. We can also, um, if we open the attribute layer. Oh, yep, just the one, the one church. So there's probably more than one church on the island or in this area. Um, would be an opportunity to to try and find some more of those and tag those into OpenStreetMap. Okay. Um, So the minimal specs for running the softwares during the mission, um, really the, 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 the phone device, the tablet or phone that's running the, the drone mapping software is the, is the key piece. And usually um, some of them like drone deploy recommend having a newer iPhone or iPad device the reason for that, I think, is that it's a little bit easier for the software developers to make an app for Apple products. Um, when you make an, an iPhone or uh, iPad app, there's, you know, less than 10, probably like th really only three or four different models of phone or hardware that you need to design for. Um, all the specifications are very similar and like the the devices are all very uniform because they're all from one supplier. They all have um, kind of a standard way of being produced. When you're designing for Android, um, you know, there's hundreds or even thousands of different Android devices um, with different hardware, different kind of um, slightly different uh, system softwares, uh, whether, you know, depending on if you buy a, a Samsung or a, um, you know, something made in China or um, Nokia or whatever else. Um, and so creating a app that works very smoothly um, can be a bigger challenge. So usually, you know, with some of the, the drone mapping, either it helps to have an Apple device or um, if you are using an Android, kind of using one of the, the more common larger manufacturers um, that's a little bit more well known um, can can help make it work more smoothly. Um, for the the rest of it, um, like almost any laptop should do, um, you probably will be processing 
uh, the imagery on the cloud somewhere. Um, so you just need something laptop with enough storage to to hold all the images while you upload them. Uh, for for QGIS, if you're just mapping, you're making a map of a single barangay, like you should be able to have a pretty basic laptop um, and do all of that just fine. It's only if you're mapping, you know, doing a detailed map of an entire province or something that it, you might have uh, enough data that it becomes more of a problem. Um, and I think QGIS is pretty good about running on some of the older, older operating systems. I haven't checked, um, but it's been around for a while. Um, so it should, should be available, or you might be able to install um, an older, a slightly older version of QGIS, maybe not the most recent one, and, and if you need to run it on an older laptop. Um, yeah. So thank you, everyone. Um, if there's there's kind of um, there's a VCA geo portal that uses Arc ArcGIS. So Esri, um, ESRI Esri is a company that produces um, kind of like the the main GIS software in the proprietary space. Um, used by a lot of governments and agencies and things like that. Um, and they have a variety of tools, including um, ArcGIS. Um, so I would, I would need to get an introduction to the VCA GeoPortal platform. Um, I think it, they use like Arc Collector or something like that, maybe to to collect geopoints and and send it to a a web um, web platform. Um, I would think that any data that's collected and sent to a VCA platform or an ArcGIS could be exported, um, and then you could you know style it as you wanted for a a print map or use it in other places. Um, a lot of the data collected for VCA um, is probably data that it would be useful to put into OpenStreetMap. Um, if it's added to OpenStreetMap, it's available, you know, immediately for the IFRC, for Philippines Red Cross, for anybody else, any, you know, the UN, uh, any other NGO or agency, humanitarian agency working in the area. It's also available then for the barangay, municipal, and provincial um, staff, uh, anyone who wants to uh, access it and, and make um, make a map, um, analyze the data in some way. Uh, there is a very cool um, tool that was originally developed um, by the government of Indonesia and um, funded, I think, by the Australian government um, called InnaSafe. That's a plugin for QGIS um, that lets you combine OpenStreetMap data and hazard data to produce um, risk modeling. So you can say, you know, here's my flood extent from 10 years ago when we had that really bad flood. Um, if the flood happened again today, looking at the OpenStreetMap data, how many buildings would be affected? How many schools would be affected? Um, how, much, uh, how much do we need in our warehouses to be able to respond to this disaster? Um, and I think actually, there, uh, um, so the Philippines, I think it says, um, 
adapted the in a safe tool um, for the use in the in the Philippines. I'm not sure what the current status of that is, but it might um, the Philippines Emergency Operation Center might know more or might have um, somebody there might have experience with um, with that project. Um, so you know if the if you're collecting basic information in the VCA about the the buildings, the roads, the infrastructure, um, key things like schools, health posts, and whatnot, um, all of that is is very useful beyond just the VCA. And OpenStreetMap is a great place uh, to to put that so it's available for everyone and anyone who might might have a use for it. <clears throat> 